Welcome everybody, this is Dr. Bruce Perry and this is session two in the Child Trauma Academy's seven slide series. Today's topic is on sensitization and tolerance. One of the really unique properties of neurons is their ability to adjust their sensitivity depending upon the pattern and intensity of the signals that they're receiving. This turns out to be very, very important for a number of molecular processes. And of course, these changes in the neuron and in neural networks underlie some of the most important observations about sensitization and tolerance of function in human beings. Many of you, I think, are familiar with the concept of tolerance as it applies to the use of a medication. Some of you may have taken a pain medication uh, after surgery or for some other reason and noticed that over time the same amount of medication that previously helped you tolerate the pain no longer works and you have to increase the dose. Some of you may have also heard of the concept of sensitization and kindling. And I'll talk about both of those in a little bit. But what I want to do is, is talk specifically about the importance of the pattern of stimulation as it pertains to the sensitivity of these fundamental neural networks that we have talked about in a previous session. As you will recall, very, very important neural networks that are widely distributed throughout multiple areas of the brain originate low in the brain. These neural networks include dopamine, norepinephrine, serotonin. They're very, very important because they influence outflow from the brain to the body and they distribute to almost every other part of the brain and play a major role in essentially all functions that are brain mediated. The sensitivity of these systems can be dramatically changed by the pattern of stimulation that they receive. If, for example, you take some stimulus, and this could be a, a drug or it could be stress, and you activate one of these neural networks, you'll get a certain level of activation for a certain amount of stimulation. And if you then wait a couple of weeks and you come in and you stimulate with the same intensity, you will get the same response from those systems. In other words, the same signal. The same stimulus leads to the same response. And again, if you wait for a longer period of time, like three days, a week, and stimulate that system again with, with the same level and intensity of input, you'll get the same signal. Now what can happen is, if you start to change the way you are stimulating that system, you can change the sensitivity of that system. So let's pretend that you take one of those core neural networks and you provide a pattern of activation that is low moderate activation, but it's persistent. It's continuous. It's very repetitive. And over time, what happens is the system begins to adapt to that non-stop, ongoing, continuous input, and it makes itself less sensitive. You develop tolerance to that signal. Now, this is a really, really important adaptive process that neural networks use to essentially allow them to be responsive to the environment that they are functioning in. And you can keep up this chronic stimulation and ultimately get to the point where the system is very, almost unresponsive. And this, of course, is something that many of you are familiar with in context of drugs of abuse. Now, there's an interesting opposite kind of response that can occur when the pattern of activation is not 
the same way. Rather than having a moderate, continuous, predictable activation that the neural network adapts to, you start providing a set of stimuli that are inconsistent, they don't have the same timing, they don't have the same intensity. In other words, there's predictable, episodic extreme, and variable stimuli. That leads to the system becoming actually more sensitive. And you develop sensitization. And in some ways, depending upon the specific stimulus or the specific network you're studying, you can get to the point where the system is so overly reactive that a tiny little stimulus that previously would have caused a moderate activation can lead to an extreme activation and even something like a seizure uh, or some other uh, significant functional deterioration and compromise. Now those of you who know much about the stress response know that that's exactly what happens when you look at the patterns of stress that lead either to a system that is resilient and capable of tolerating significant stressors or a system that has been stressed in, a, in an unpredictable, severe, and prolonged way. One pattern of activation is toxic and leads to a whole range of functional compromise in the body and in a variety of brain-mediated functions. The other pattern results in a flexible stress response capability, making the individual more capable of dealing with stressors. Now the interesting thing is those of you who are tracking with this will know that one of the most important observations about trauma-related alterations in function is the development of a vulnerability that arises from a sensitized stress response system. And we'll talk in future sessions about which components of the stress response can become sensitized and what that looks like clinically. But in this case, what I want you to remember is that if you are lucky enough to have a normal stress response reactivity and you are in an environment where there's a baseline level of arousal, you will have a linear response such that you'll be in an active alert state. And if you are exposed to a little bit of stressor, you can get into a low level alarm state. And if you have extreme stress, you can get into the fear state. And of course, you can go up and down this curve depending upon the circumstances of the day or the week and so forth. So you and I, who have normal linear relationship between internal response and external challenge, external threat, external stress, will be on this line. Individuals who've had a sensitizing pattern of stress activation, in other words, kids that grow up in chaos, who grow up in unpredictable, threatening environments, who are exposed to a variety of either natural disasters or man-made disasters, and individuals who are victimized by abuse and neglect end up on this curve. And what that means is, even at baseline, in the absence of any external threat, their brain says that they are under attack. And what that means is they will think differently, they'll function differently, and they will behave differently. This, of course, underlies many of the observations of uh, educators, caregivers, mental health professionals who work with children and adults who've been exposed to trauma. We'll talk more about this in a future series. Thank you for spending some time with us. Uh, we look forward to sharing more seven slide series with you in the future. In the meantime, if you want more information about this and related topics, please feel free to visit us at the Child Trauma Academy. We will do our best to help you find resources that will serve your needs.